afternoon, everyone. I'm Sandy Vandenberg, Director of Plan Giving at Torrance Memorial's Foundation Office, and I'm happy to welcome you back to our financial health webinar. Uh, we are really hoping to get this in person again, as so many of you have attended in our um, health conference center on a Saturday morning. And so we're looking forward to being able to do that again. I just can't tell you when it's going to happen. So I really do miss seeing your smiling faces as you enter and being able to greet you. And I look forward to the time when we can do that again. So we're coming to you today from our auditorium, which is here in the West Tower. And uh, it's just the presenters and myself in here and our wonderful crew in the control room with Alex Baker as our media services manager, managing the technical aspects and Margaret uh, Duran from my office who is helping with uh, answering the phone for questions and uh, helping to record that. So thank you to Margaret and Alex for your help as well. So this seminar series is called Taking Care of Your Financial Health and it's brought to you by our Professional Advisory Council and uh, by Torrance Memorial. So our Professional Advisory Council is a group of volunteer uh, uh, estate planning attorneys, financial planners, CPAs, um, life care managers, professional fiduciaries, groups who work with folks to uh, make a good plan with their estate and also to learn about the, the benefits of um, tax planning for um, with giving for charity and uh, how you can benefit um, your current situation and uh, the future after you're gone uh, with the, that kind of planning. So we really appreciate this group for their support and sharing their expertise and their time with us. And also their, um, they also give uh, annually too to help support the hospital. So thank you to our professional advisory council members who are here today and uh, those who are watching online. So you should have received, if you registered in advance, you should have received an email from me yesterday, which included the, the handout for the PowerPoint today. It's also posted on our website on the event page and uh, will be available also uh, when we post the recording of the webinar. Uh, when that happens, I will email everyone who registered and so you'll be able to have the handout. And um, so, and for those who would like a copy of it mailed, just email me and I will uh, mail a printed copy to you uh, as well. We like to hold all the questions until the end. And so as questions come up during the presentation, if you would enter them in the chat uh, feature of Zoom, you'll find that in about the middle of the screen at the bottom. You can enter the chat there and uh, we'll record that and, and provide it to the presenters to answer at the end. If you're not familiar with how that chat feature works, you can also call 310-784-4843 and that will ring where Margaret is sitting and she will write down your question for you so we can be sure to um, address it as time allows. The, the view you have on Zoom is uh, should show the PowerPoint and the speaker in the corner. Um, you have some control over how you look at that too in the upper right corner if you uh, wanna play around with that. The, the um, I mentioned we will record the webinar and uh, we will post it for future uh, viewing for about 90 days on our website and I'll send out that link after we have it set up. So I want, I always like to give a little bit of a highlight of what's going on at Torrance Memorial. First of all, I'm happy to report that our uh, COVID inpatient numbers have come way down since the peak in and, and January. We had over 150 on January 20, and it's come down to less than five now, I believe, of, of patients who are in isolation. So we're happy to say that is um, has really um, been a good improvement. We are still seeing a lot of patients and have a pretty full hospital with folks who have delayed their health care and uh, missed their screening appointments and those kinds of things. So. Um, I want to encourage all of you to keep up with your doctor appointments and uh, be sure to uh, give attention to that. We're excited to be opening a building in El Segundo. I live there and so I took this picture on a walk a couple weeks ago. So I am uh, happy to have the Torrance Memorial presence in El Segundo. We'll be opening the urgent care I think is the first thing to open in April and some of the physician offices will have um, the urgent care an endoscopy center there, an imaging pavilion, a blood draw station, and then several physician offices for primary care, OBGYN and other specialists. And it's all, there also will be space for some of the specialists from Cedar sinai who's, who we're affiliated with to see patients there. So it's going to be a great 
uh, offer to the community a great presence there. It's located at 2110 East El Segundo Boulevard. That's between Nash and Continental in the area that used to be green space in front of the Raytheon building. So they sold some of that property to Continental Development Corp, who is uh, the company Richard Lundquist is, uh, is, owns. And, um, and so the area has, a, um, what's it called? The, the uh, Raising Canes, the drive-through Panera, um, a coffee shop is coming, I think. And the Chargers will be building their training facility right next to our building. So we're excited about that development there. The other news here is that we launched a new website in, on February 17. It has a new look and feel, and it should be pretty easy to navigate. It has uh, links to our Torrance Memorial Physician Network and the IPA right up there in the top right-hand corner. And this is just the top of the screen, but it's, it's a really a well done um, website. So you'll have to play around with it. You'll have to look at in different places for things that you found before in other areas. So, um, but it's, we're excited to have that, that new look. Um, oh, and I want to mention too, always the monthly Medicare 101 class um, uh, is still happening online and that will be on March 23 at 630. We often get questions about Medicare and uh, we want to be able to um, keep you informed about that. So we always point you in the direction of that excellent webinar they, that our Torrance Memorial IPA does. And then our Miracle Living, next, the next health um, lecture will be in May. There was a, a little conflict with the March date that had been planned. So in May, you can look for that. So I mentioned I'm director of plan giving. I always like to highlight just some of the different types of plan gifts, the most common being a bequest where you include uh, Torrance Memorial in your will and trust for uh, a gift, uh, maybe a, a small or a large percentage of your estate. We love the large ones. So, um, you know, it's great to be able to continue to support the hospital for future generations to, um, you know, by giving a gift. And um, there are some uh, income generating types of gifts like the gift annuity and the charitable remainder trust. If you have any questions about any of those, please don't hesitate to call me and I'll be happy to, to chat with you about that. I also always like to highlight this um, opportunity using your RMD, your required minimum distribution from your IRA. You can donate, if you're 70 and a half, you can donate up to $100,000 directly to a charity and then you don't have to add it to your income, ta to your income tax return. And so you can save on some taxes that way. So it's, um, it, it is um, outlined here on the, on the page. You also will become a member of our Heritage Society, which is the group of folks who have included us in their estate plan. We believe the IRA is part of your estate plan. And so we'd like to honor you for um, and appreciate you for the gifts you give us uh, from that. Um, the, we have a great uh, website that offers a lot of resources and tools and my contact information is there as well. So you can um, reach out if you have questions. On this website, there's a uh, toolkit. It's an estate uh, planning kit where it, there's one document that kind of teaches about things and then there's a record book, which is so helpful because it provides you the opportunity to put all of your assets and your bank accounts and and all of your information about your beneficiaries and all of that in one place. So it's a great document that helps you to organize what your, what your plan is. So take a look at that. We also have some financial health uh, articles on that on the site that's listed there at the bottom on the foundation site under the news um, section. And that's where we also have um, posted the recordings of our past seminars. So those are, are some tools for you to look at. And um, we also do appreciate your current gifts. And so I um, want to uh, highlight the um, opportunity here of how you can make the donation to Torrance Memorial. So um, now I'm going to turn it over to one of the co-chairs of our uh, professional advisory council. He is sharing that role with Grace St. Clair, who is uh, an estate planning attorney in Redondo Beach. But Larry Takahashi is a certified financial planner here in Torrance. His primary focus is helping clients build strategies for a successful retirement, including creating an effective retirement income plan and minimizing the impact of taxes during retirement and on their estate. 
So I'm going to welcome Larry to the podium, and he is going to introduce our speakers for today. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so to get things started, I do uh, need to read this disclosure. Uh, this material is for general information only. It's not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine what is appropriate for you, please consult qualified professionals. All right, so today's webinar is entitled Savvy Social Security Planning, and uh, I'd like to introduce uh, our presenters. First, Kristen Harris-Rigg. Kristen is a certified financial planner and certified divorce financial analyst with EP Wealth Advisors in Torrance. Kristen and her firm offer fee-based wealth management services to individuals and families throughout the country. Kristen specializes in serving women in transition, women facing retirement, divorce, and widowhood. An advisor with the heart of a teacher, Kristen explains every detail to her clients until they get it and can then make informed decisions. And her greatest accomplishment is being the proud mother of her 11-year-old son, Ashton. Uh, next, we have Tom Schlapatha. Tom is a certified financial planner since 2003 with Morgan Stanley Wealth Management in Torrance. He brings a proficient skill set derived from his engineering background and work experience as an operations manager. His financial practice focuses on retirement income, tax reducing strategies, money management, sophisticated estate planning, financial and retirement planning services. He's dedicated to providing quality, long-term relationships with his clients to help them simplify their financial life and goals. In his free time, Tom enjoys spending time with wife Krista and his teenage twin boys who keep him busy with their sports practices and games. So I am now going to turn it over to Kristen. Thank you so much. Appreciate it and welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us today to talk about social security. Um, this is a truly important topic really because for most people, it's one of the most significant sources of income during retirement. One of the problems with social security right now that we see is that people often overlook or misunderstand the various rules that can actually limit your benefit or the claiming strategies that can help maximize benefits. Um, we see this a lot because we find that people often don't do two things. Number one, they don't take the time to crunch the numbers or work with a professional to crunch their actual numbers and see what the best strategy is for them. And the other is that we all tend to misunderstand our own longevity and we underestimate how long we could actually live. But the reality is, is that most people today are living much longer and are living longer than the average life expectancy than a male or female. And the longer we live, the more important it is to ensure we have income to support our retirement needs. So we're here today so that you don't shortchange yourself. And I'll go ahead and get started here about a few things to think about social security or things to know when we're thinking about social security. The first is that you do have many, many claiming options, and we're going to address a few of those today. Um, the second is that your decision can have far reaching consequences. And what I mean by that really ties into the third bullet point is that if as a married couple, um, one spouse's decision on when to start or claim their benefit can directly impact the other spouse and how much the combined income a married couple can bring in throughout their retirement. Another thing to know is that the system currently is not going bankrupt. It's bankrupt. It's not a Ponzi scheme. And we'll address the solvency issue in just a minute. Um, and then a, a few other things. Um, benefits have likely helped other family members in the past. But I think really importantly is that we tend to get a lot of comments or questions or advice from our friends or coworkers about what to do about social security. And it's truly best to know the facts and work with a professional. So the way we're gonna address some of these topics today um, is by looking at this agenda. So I'm just gonna talk briefly about 
understanding the value of social security. And then Tom will address, will social security be there for you? And that solvency issue that I mentioned. And then I'll address how much you can expect to receive. Tom will address when you should apply. And then we'll close it out with a few strategies on how to maximize your benefits. So I'll jump right into the first one, which is understanding the value of social security. So here's a chart and quite simply, the way to look at this is uh, say you have just applied for your benefit, um, or excuse me, let's say that your benefit is going to be $2,000 a month at your full retirement age. What this means, because uh, Social Security applies what's called a cost of living adjustment to your benefit each year, meaning your benefit is going to keep up with the level infl of inflation and increase each year, depending on what that inflation level is. In this case, we've used a 2.6% average annual inflation increase. So based on that assumption, if your benefit is $2,000 a month, in 10 years, you will have collected $270,000. But as we know, most people are living much longer than 10 years into retirement. So if your 2000 benefit today um, is, has started, in 20 years, you will have collected 619,000. But the reality is, is that most people are living much longer, 30, 40 years into retirement. And you can see you will collect over a million dollars through your lifetime if you do in fact live that long. It just shows that we're dealing with a pretty significant amount of money. So your decision is really important on when to apply. And then as I mentioned earlier, cost of living adjustments are applied to your monthly benefit. So just to give you an idea of what that means, um, in this example, again, if your monthly benefit is $2,000 a month, in 10 years, as these cost of living adjustments are applied to that benefit each year, you'll be collecting $2,500 a month. But if you look to 30 years at the bottom here, that $2,000 benefit that you started with will now be worth $4,320. So this is one of the few kind of pensions left in our society that actually keeps up with inflation. So just that kind of hopefully shows you the value of social security. Um, so what we're gonna do now, I'm gonna turn it over to Tom and we'll, he'll talk about will social security be there for you? Great, thanks Kristen. So one of the big uh, questions a lot of people have um, in terms of uh, looking at this uh, trust fund, and essentially that's what it is. Um, the, what it's called is the Old Age Survivor Disability Insurance, or short as OASDI, and it's essentially a trust fund. And as you can see here, the values um, since 2020 have actually gone up. So at the end of 2020, the trust fund had uh, just uh, just under 2.9 billion or trillion dollars, excuse me. And at the end of last year, the uh, trust fund uh, had 2.9 trillion, a little over 2. 2.9 trillion dollars, which was an increase of about 13 trillion dollars or 13 billion dollars. Sorry. So, um, what the biggest concern is is long term. So, for most people on this uh, webinar here, it isn't going to be an issue, and it probably won't be an issue for baby boomers or probably Generation X. It's f further along than that, because what you can see here is that the trust fund actually has um, is funded through 2034 at about 100 percent. So there's really no concerns, um, you know, up until 2034. And you can see from the chart there is that red line there and it extends beyond that uh, 2034 period. The income level um, is substantially high. The problem runs into is once 2034 comes about and a lot of the baby boomers are starting to retire plus the COLA adjustments, um, you start running out of uh, um, principal. And basically, there's just not going to be enough uh, income coming into the trust fund to sustain long term the, um, the viability of the uh, payouts. And so you can see there in 2035, the trust fund, even statistically, 79% is still pretty high. Typically, anything over about 70% is usually what uh, a target is for any kind of pension fund. And even well into 2094, there's about 73% uh, um, you know, coverage. So, you know, in terms of, you know, people concerned about, uh, you know, having, you know, th this here and having their, their social security checks going away, that's probably not going to happen. 
So, um, but we do need to, you know, consider long term what uh, what the payout situation is going to be, and that's what we're going to go over here now. There's a handful of reforms. We're going to talk about four of them um, that the, the government has talked about doing. The first one here is if you take a look in 2022. Social Security is taxed up to a maximum income of 147,000. Unlike Medicare, which has unlimited income taxability, this one is capped at $147,000. So if you put it in terms of dollars, so a person making $147,000, the tax rate on Social Security works out to 12.4%, which breaks down to the employee and the employer. So the employee pays 6.2%, the employer pays the other 6.2%. Um, if you're self-employed, you pay the whole 12%, 12.4%. So in dollar terms, it works out to approximately $18,000 a year of a person making $147,000. So if a person making $100,000 a year, it's 12, roughly 12,000. So each would split, the employer and the employee um, would split that amount. So one of the things they've talked about is, is possibly increasing significantly that 147,000 maybe not doing like Medicare is, which is unlimited, but maybe raising it up to a substantially higher number, which is maybe 200,000. Because right now it's only adjusted for inflation, so it slowly goes up. But uh, you know, this is one of the options to, to, to reform the uh, trust fund. The second uh, proposal that's been out there, and it's been out there for a while, is increasing the age. And as you can see here, for retirees that were born in 1943 to 1954, uh, the full retirement age is age 66. So once you hit age 66, and we'll talk about that here in later slides, what, what that actually means, you can see you get full retirement. And then, you know, through the different years, basically it goes up a little bit. And, and anybody born after 1960, your full retirement age is 67. So what the uh, uh, trustees have looked at in one possible um, option is, is to increase that age. And since people are living a lot longer, as Kristen mentioned, they've talked about possibly uh, taking it up to age 70. And uh, they will have to make some other adjustments accordingly, but uh, you'll see some of that here in, in a little bit. Another proposal they've talked about is, is reducing the cost of living adjustment, which everybody's kind of relied on. Um, you can see here, these are the, the increases that have happened since 1983. You can see 2022, the adjustment went up pretty substantially because inflation has been running much higher recently, 5.9%. But if you take a look at the average over this period of time, um, as Kristen said before, I think it worked out to about 2.6%. So what they've talked about is, 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 is making the calculation a little bit different than just taking a look at uh, um, the COLA adjustment and you know, possibly also you know, adjusting it um, according to you know, people's income. So obviously the higher income you make, maybe you get less and vice versa, lower income people would get a little bit more of an adjustment. So these are kind of the you know, third reform they've talked about. And then fourth is um, basically, you know, adjusting it. So it's, it, it's, uh, it's not necessarily just based on consumer prices, um, rather wage increases. And so what that would mean is rather than adjusting the, uh, uh, the payout on social security based on the COLA adjustment, for people that are making higher income levels are going to end up getting less and people with lower income levels would potentially get more. So these are just four areas that they've talked about, um, you know, making adjustments. Uh, they haven't put anything on concrete, you know, yet, but um, they definitely do have to take a look at it. But the bottom line is, you know, for most people, as I said on this, on this uh, webinar and for the baby boomers that are, are, you know, just in retirement or just getting ready to retire, it's not going to be an issue at all. And I think that's uh, typically one of the big concerns for most individuals. So what I'll do now is uh, have Kristen come up here and talk about how much you, you can expect once you start drawing the Social Security. Okay, great. Thanks, Tom. Okay, we're at number three. How much can you expect to receive? So we thought we'd start off this section by telling you how to first find out what you are entitled to. Um, for those of you that have not uh, registered on the Social Security website, this is the first thing you should do. And I've listed the site here at www.ssa.gov. And what you'll want to do is go to this site and then click on My Social Security and then create your account. And then I will say if you're creating your account for the first time, they do ask quite a few security questions. But once you get through that process, um, and you're able to log in, then you can go in and download your most current social security statement. 
Um, you can also, there's a few calculators on their site where you can actually look at your benefit and see pretty immediately what it would look like if you started collecting early versus later. So there are some good calculators on there. Actually, they recall, they call them the retirement estimator. So this is important that everyone does this. And then once you've done that, you can see your statement. So when you're looking at your statement, you're gonna find um, on page two or four, there's an earnings record. And this is what is used to calculate your benefit. Your benefit that you're actually going to receive depends on two factors. It depends on one, how much you've earned over your working career. And the other one is the age at which you apply for benefits. So let me look, let me show you this a little bit more. So when we talk about the earnings record, and this is kind of a, a snapshot of what that looks like in your statement. Um, the way the administration actually calculates your benefit, it's actually a complicated formula um, that they use, but generally to understand it, it's that once you're at age 62, each year of your earnings are tallied, going back to whenever you started working. And each year of those earnings are tallied and then they're all indexed for inflation. So, uh, and then they apply their formula to get to your benefit. But here's what's important to know and why you should check your earnings record is that they use the highest 35 years of earnings. So if you've worked 50 years, they're gonna use the highest 35 years. If you've worked 10 years, they're gonna use all 10, 10 of those years. And then they're also going to factor in the rest of those years as zero years. So the more zero years you have, really what it means is that the lower your benefit will be. So when we talk about, um, for some people that are entering retirement, um, sometimes it's good to continue working part-time or you know, working in some fashion just to erase some of those zero years. For example, if you've got 30 years of earnings and you can actually replace those zero years the more years you work. So the idea to get the highest benefit is to have an earnings amount for as many years as possible. Um, so that's a sample earnings record and how benefits are calculated. Once your benefit is calculated and you'll see this on your statement, it'll read at age 60, at your full retirement age, it, either 66 or 67, it'll give you the monthly benefit amount. And then it'll say, but if you start collecting at 62, you'll receive this reduced amount, and then at 70, this amount. To make it a little bit easier, this is really the percentage reduction that you're looking at um, on the screen here. So if you apply for benefits early, you're going to get a permanent reduction. So as an example, if you look at this chart, if you apply at age 63, instead of waiting until your full retirement age of 66 or 67, you apply at 63, then you're gonna get a reduced amount of either reduced by reduced down to 80% or 75% of what your actual benefit would be. Um, and let's just keep it simple and we'll look at the middle column. So let, for example, if you're uh, apply at age 65, you're not gonna get all of your benefit, you're gonna get 93.3% of your benefit. And that decision that you make is irrevocable, except for there is one instance, which I'll talk about in a minute, but it's irrevocable. And once you start benefits, it's a permanent reduction. So I often tell clients when I'm meeting with clients in this age range, which is so important for retirement planning, you know, rather like, for example, if you're age 62 and you really, you've, you've retired and you really just want to get this income coming into your bank, we, re we look at other strategies and I really try to have clients take it one year at a time because it truly is beneficial to wait until at least your full retirement age. Um, but beyond that, and what's even better is that if you apply after your full retirement age, so between the age of 66 and 70, for each year you wait, you get an additional 8% in delayed retirement credits. So again, looking at this chart, let's say your full retirement age is 66. If you apply at age 70, you're not just gonna get 100% of your benefit, you're gonna get 132%. And dollar-wise, that makes a big difference. So the longer you wait, the higher your benefit will be, and that's a permanent benefit. Um, and age 70 is the longest you can wait. So you can't wait till 72. Once you're 70, you need to be on record with applying, or excuse me, receiving your social security benefit. 
And then another thing to know when you're reading your social security statement is that the benefit estimates that are being reported to you are being reported in today's dollars. So what do I mean by that? If you look at this example, um, I use Lisa, she's 57 today and she will reach her full retirement age at age 67 in 10 years. So today at 57, her current social security statement shows that at her age 62, her, she'll get $1,491 a month, et cetera. Those dollars are written in today's dollars, but what it actually means is that by the time she's actually at retirement age or 62, that benefit will have grown with the cost of living adjustment. So she won't just get the 1491, she'll get the 1,927. So it's a lot of numbers. I think really the takeaway from all this talk with cost of living adjustments is how important they are and how much it can impact a benefit. And the longer you wait, along with the cost of living adjustment, the better it can be. Okay, so now we're moving on to spousal benefits. Um, so a spousal benefit is really half of the other spouse's benefit. That's really the easiest way to say it. So let me go through the example. So we have John and Jane who are married. Both have reached their full retirement age of 66. And John is entitled to an individual benefit of $2,000 a month. And Jane is entitled to her own individual benefit of $800 a month. So Jane, just, just looking at Jane's situation as a spouse, she could do one of two things. She could apply for her spousal benefit, which in this case would be half of John's. So Jane would either be entitled to $1,000, which is her spousal benefit, or the $800, which is her individual benefit. So in this case, it would be better for her to apply for her spousal benefit. So it's, that's the general rule for spouses. Um, now with spouses, there's a lot of other rules that have to occur. For a spouse to apply for a spousal benefit, the other spouse has to be on record of taking their benefit. So meaning if you go back to, uh, let's see, John and Jane, John's individual benefit is 2000. He must be currently getting that benefit today in order for Jane to go and apply for her half or her spousal benefit. So that's important to know. She can not She can no longer go in and apply for a spousal benefit if her husband hasn't applied for his own benefit. It used to be different, but that changed to this in 2015. And then a spouse can apply for a spousal benefit as early as age 62. But again, if you apply early, it's reduced. So again, a spousal benefit is 50% or half of your spouse's benefit. But if you apply for the spousal benefit early, you're gonna get the reduction. And this chart you could see rather than getting, if Jane is 63, rather than getting the full half or 50% of the benefit, she'll get 37.5%. And then lastly, those delayed retirement credits that I mentioned earlier on the 8% earnings credit that you can receive on your benefit from age 66 to 70, uh, those do not apply to spousal benefits. Delayed retirement credits are, only apply to individual benefits. And then a word about divorced spousal benefits. Um, so if you are divorced and you are uh, married for 10 years or longer and you're not re currently remarried, then you have the option of applying for a spousal benefit on your ex-spouse's record. Um, so I, I have to repeat this in my head because <laughs> there's a lot of rules with this too, but just to keep it, so for anyone divorced, um, it's important to look at, for anyone divorced and not currently remarried, it's important for that person to analyze whether their individual benefit is higher or if it would be better to take their uh, spousal benefit on a divorced spouse. And this person can have this analysis done and apply for a divorced spousal benefit without con having to contact the ex-spouse if that's an issue. The ex-spouse will never be informed that you applied for the benefit at all. You, you are entitled to that. And I've listed the rules here, but I'll just share a really quick funny story just to lighten things up a little bit. So, <laughs> um, well, it's a story that I heard in my, uh, when I was taking my uh, CFP class and it was, so it was a long time ago, 
Um, but this advisor shared with us that he knew someone that was married four times and each of those four marriages lasted um, over 10 years and none of the ex-spouses had remarried. And so all of the ex-spouses were allowed to collect a spousal benefit on his record. So just thought it was interesting. <laughs> Wonder what's wrong with the system, I don't know. <laughs> Um, anyway, so there's a lot of rules here. Just know that if um, there's a divorce situation, there is an opportunity to collect income in other ways. And then lastly for this section, if uh, survivor's benefits, and these are really, really important. Um, the general rule is that as a married couple, if one spouse passes away, the surviving spouse can collect what's called a survivor's benefit. A survivor's benefit is 100% of the deceased spouse's benefit. So just remember, a spousal benefit is half or 50%, a survivor's benefit is 100%. So let's look at this example. Um, Jack and Jill are married, and Jack is receiving 2,000 a month, and Jill is receiving 1,200 a month, and Jack passes away. Jill will then have one of the two benefits, whichever is higher. So Jill, in this case, Jill's $1,200 benefit would go away and then she would be left with her survivor's benefit, which was Jack's, which was $2,000. So I think it's important to remember that when one spouse does pass away, you don't get to keep both benefits. The surviving spouse can keep the higher of the two benefits. But like with everything else in social security, there's a lot of rules for survivor's benefits. Um, but I think on this slide, I'll just put that in order to collect a survivor's benefit, you have to have been married for at least nine months. And you can actually start collecting survivor's benefits at age 60, although it will be a reduced benefit. And then there's a few other rules on here. I, I won't jump into all the, um, all the minutia of this, but I'll just say one more thing about survivor's benefits. And this chart, I, is, there's so many numbers here. But what I wanna just point out with survivor's benefit is, and this goes back to how our decisions impact our family members. With survivor's benefits, yes, you're able to collect 100% of your spouse's benefit once, if, when they're deceased. But what is also looked at is that if you applied for your own individual benefit early, and let's, let's, let's take Jack and Jill. Let's say that Jack has passed away and Jill goes in to collect her survivor's benefit. If Jack and Jill had, had applied for their benefits early, the amount that she will get as a survivor's benefit would be much less than if Jack, in this case, had waited to age 70. So just putting that in dollar terms and forgetting this chart here, if Jack was collecting $2,400 a month um, when he passed away, um, or would have been collecting 2,400 a month, but Jack had decided to start early and collect a lower benefit and is instead, instead is, was collecting 1,700 a month. That's the benefit Jill's going to get. But if Jack had started later, he would have been collecting over 3,000 a month and that would have been the benefit Jill would have received. So with spouses, it's important to understand that one spouse's decision has a direct impact on a surviving spouse later on. Okay, that was a lot of information, but now we'll look at when you should actually apply. So I'll turn it over to Tom. Okay. All right, here are five factors that uh, you should consider when uh, deciding you know, when to start taking your social security. And I think some of them are pretty obvious health issues or health status. Um, you know, if, if, if your, your health is, is not that good and, you know, your life expectancy is, is relatively, uh, you know, short, you may want to start consider taking it even at age 62. Um, you know, many clients of ours, you know, do decide to do that because of that. And uh, because, you know, at the end of the day, if the income needs to come from somewhere, they're either taking it from Social Security or maybe from their, 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 their retirement accounts. And, uh, you know, if they have a terminal Ill illness, um, you know, they may want to start considering taking it earlier. Life expectancy, that, that's the other end of the equation. I mean, if, if there's longevity in your family, um, you know, both my parents lived, my mom just turned 92. Uh, my dad uh, passed away a few years ago at age 83, but there's quite a bit of longevity in, uh, in, in my family. So the odds are pretty high 
that uh, you know that that I'll live a little longer than than most. And uh, statistically, if there's a husband and wife that uh, you know in their 60s, the odds are pretty high that one of them will live into their 90s. So you really have to kind of consider that. And um, we'll show you some uh, dollar amounts here in a little bit. Uh, next few slides that kind of you know off or discuss that why you might want to consider you know deferring or delaying your 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 retire your your full retirement age and maybe until age 70. Um, need for income again if, if the income need is there and you don't have other sources maybe you do start taking it early we encourage people as much as possible to defer you know taking these social security as much as you can rather than starting at 62 because as Kristen said it's a reduced benefit um, you know, so being able to defer it, but if there's a need for the income, obviously turning it on uh, might make sense for you. Um, whether or not you continue planning on working. So there is a stipulation that uh, you can continue to work if you draw Social Security. The problem is if you start drawing it at age 62 and until full retirement age, so let's assume that's 66 um, or 67, basically you... Um, you forgive some of your social security. So for every, every $2 you earn, the, the, uh, the social security will basically take back a dollar for every uh, $2 that you earn up to a, a certain level of income. So you wanna be really careful about that. You know, once you hit full retirement age, as my dad did, he worked until in his seventies, um, you know, he was able to work and, and draw his social security without any giving back any benefit. So that's something to consider too. And also survivor needs, you know, what, what is your spouse, spousal? You know, survivor benefits. What what does it look like? What what do you think? If one of you again is going to live well into your 90s, you may, that that's going to be a big consideration. So here's basically delaying the benefits. Here's a chart that kind of gives you an idea of uh, you know what you can expect in terms of payout. The assumption here is that your full retirement age is 67. Uh, the person would be receiving $2,800 a a month, and the uh, COLA adjustment is 2.6%. So what you can see there is at age 62, you basically are getting a reduced benefit um, down to about 70%. So a $2,800 benefit that you thought you were gonna get will be reduced down to about $1,960 without the COLA adjustment. And it'll be the same uh, with the COLA adjustment. You go to age 63, you can see there, it's about a 75% payout. The benefit without the COLA is about 2,100, but then you see the $2,155 there gives you that extra 2.6% bump in, uh, in, in monthly income. So you can see it's a pretty substantial discount, you know, taking it at, a, at, you know, at 62 rather than waiting. And as you can see there, after full retirement age, um, which is at 100%, every year after that, it does go up 8%. So if you take a look there for a 70 year old with the COLA adjustment, it's 124% of their full retirement benefit but the payment goes from $2,800 up to $4,263 per month. So think about that. And, and, and again, for, from a longevity standpoint, if there's another 20 or 25 years of payments needed for one of you um, living into your 90s, that, that's gonna be a substantial difference uh, in payment you know, going forward. So if you don't need the income immediately, sometimes deferring is gonna be a, a you know, much better solution. Um, you know, this, this here just kind of shows you, um, again, you know, just delaying the benefit, what, what you can expect over various periods of time. So by deferring it until age 70, you can see there, if you claim it at age 62, what that monthly benefit looks like with the COLA adjustment. If you claim it at full retirement age, which is the middle column there, and uh, age 70 is the last column. So you can see well into your, you know, 90 years old, I mean, you can see what the monthly benefit's going to look like. I mean, it's going to be well over seven thousand dollars, presumably for one, one of you. And uh, you know, the bottom line is is uh, deferring that payment, you know, well into your, you know, till till your seventy is going to maximize any kind of uh, monthly income that you're going to get. So these are key points to remember. If you're applying early, your benefit starts lower and stays lower forever. So you really want to make sure that you know, because as Kristen said, is once you select it, you can't change it. And uh, it can definitely impact uh, your, your cash flow projections, you know, along with your other investments for, you know, extended periods of time. The COLA magnifying the impact of early retirement or delayed claiming, the longer you live, the more benefit it is, delaying the benefit. So again, it gets back to is besides the 8% growth that you're gonna get from age, full retirement age 67 until 70, um, you're getting that 2% COLA. So you're almost getting a 10% bump per year 
by deferring it. So over a three year period, you're essentially getting about a 30% bump um, in that monthly payment. And then decision impact and the survivor benefit also, again, as I, as I mentioned, the fact that the you know, longevity in this day and age, it might make a lot of sense to defer payment um, if you can afford to, mainly because you know, statistically, you know, one or you know, both spouses may live well into their 90s, if not into 100. So and that's, that's the thing is one of the largest increases in population growth is in people in the age of over, I believe it's over 90. So uh, you know, my mom just turned 92 and she's doing pretty good and I can't see her not living another 10 years. So you gotta really make a hard decision on what uh, your plans are long-term. So with that, I'll bring Kirsten back up to finish up here and basically how to maximize your benefit. Okay, so now we'll go into our, thanks Tom, we'll go into our uh, fifth section here on maximizing benefits. The first one, and we'll go back to your earnings record. The first one is to examine your earnings record from your latest social security statement. So the earnings that are reported on the statement are directly imported from the IRS from your tax return. And so if you look at those earnings and you see something that looks completely off, there is you can actually file a claim on the Social Security website to have that reviewed and adjusted if necessary, because if they're under reporting earnings, which is pretty rare actually for it to actually happen, but it does happen every now and then. If they're under reporting earnings, then your benefit may be lower than what you should actually be receiving. Um, and then you also wanna look for any missing years and then take a look at it if, if, as I mentioned earlier, if you have some zero years and you're able to continue working in some capacity, part-time or you know, just even a few hours a week, anything that could erase one of those past zero years, you can do that. Um, and your earnings will continue to be calculated and reported each year. So again, working, continuing to work can help replace low or zero income years. And then you also should understand the annual earnings test, which Tom really just touched on. Um, so I'll just review it quickly here. But the, the, the point is, is that if you are working and you are um, under your full retirement age and you start collecting your social security benefit, like Tom was saying, your benefits are reduced. $1 is withheld for every $2 you earn over a certain amount. Um, but this, if you, if you are collecting social security, um, you should not let this discourage you from working because once you reach full retirement age, this reduction that you can see on this slide, it actually gets fed back into your benefit over time once you reach full retirement age. I think the more important thing here is that um, you, you really want to consider not starting your benefit while you're working and under full retirement age if you have other income and are able to meet those needs. So want to understand the annual earnings test and know too that after you reach full retirement age that there is no annual earnings test. So you can work and um, collect social security and there's no offset. And then you also want to apply at the right time. So we touched on this a little bit earlier as well, but this is really the most important factor is determining when it is best for you to apply, understanding your current and future income needs, you know, estimating reasonably your life expectancy. Obviously we can't, you know, predict the future, but we can do our best, like Tom was saying, with our past family history and so forth. And then also understand what your spouse's potential life expectancy could be so that you can then work with someone to formulate a spousal strategy, for example. And so that's what I wanna talk about here. This is, for spouses, this is the most important thing you know, we talk about when to apply, but it's also coordinating spousal benefits. Um, so I gave a few examples here, but it's, it's important to know that for a spousal strategy, the best thing to do is have an analysis done. But just to give you a few examples on how this can make a difference. If you have a married couple with one spouse uh, entitled to a significantly lower benefit on social security than the other spouse, it may be beneficial for the higher, okay, so the, this says where the lower earning spouses benefit is, okay, let me start over, <laughs> even I get confused. <laughs> okay, where the lower earning spouses 
full retirement age benefit is more than half of what they would have gotten if they applied for their spouse's benefit. There are strategies to take advantage of this. And really without the math here, it's not gonna make a ton of sense, but in some cases, when we see this, we may recommend that both spouses delay their benefits to 70 so that we can completely max out both benefits. Um, and then this really allows them to maximize lifetime benefits over their life expectancies. But in some cases, we may have spouses in this case, one of them we may have start at 68 and allow the other spouse to maximize their benefit. And this is where it all depends on the current retirement situation and the income needs. But depending on the ages of each spouse and the benefits of each spouse, there is a good strategy. It's just not a one size fits all type strategy. And then there's also things we call hybrid strategies where you know, this whole time we've talked about how you should not apply before your full retirement age. Well, there are in some cases, um, in some cases where it actually can work for one spouse to apply early. So for example, if the lower earning spouse, if their own benefit is less than half of their spousal benefit, in some cases it may be beneficial for the lower earning spouse to claim early at 62 and the higher earning spouse allow their benefit to grow and claim that at 70. And so all of this, um, you know, really what this does is it, income, it generates income sooner for the couple while allowing the other one to maximize benefits. But again, it goes back to the individual situation, which is really why this is recommended, a, a true spousal analysis. You've got to run the numbers and see what the break even age, age is and what is truly best for your situation. And then uh, understanding taxation of benefits is important, although this hasn't changed much at all um, over the last few decades. These same numbers have not increased with inflation, and they've been this way, I want to say, since the 80s or 90s. Um, but essentially, these are the tax brackets for Social Security benefits. So if you have, what, what happens is the IRS looks at your total income, so maybe you have social security income and a required minimum distribution from your IRA. They look at your total income um, and then basically whatever, however your income comes out, they will apply whatever tax rate is to your social security benefits. So essentially if you have total income of under 25,000, your social security benefit will not be subject to tax. Versus if you have, I'm looking at this first column here, if you have income over 34,000, then most of your social security benefit will be taxed. So some, in some cases, when you are in low income years, it's important to look at what, it, what the effect would be of claiming social security benefits, like if you're getting a required minimum distribution. So we'll see if these tax brackets actually increase with inflation, it's been a long time. Okay, and then for this section, I did wanna kind of paint, try to paint a better picture of why it's important to maximize benefits. So this is an example of um, what we call good tax planning. So when we look at uh, an individual between the age of 60 and 70, these are the main things that have to be addressed carefully. So the first one is, and, and in this case, we're assuming that this individual has decided to retire at age 60. So if one retires at 60 and is not eligible for retiree medical benefits from their company, they really have to first carefully bridge the gap to Medicare, which starts at 65. They need to secure a personal policy, which is very costly, as I'm sure many of you, all of you know. That's the most important thing at this time period. Um, from there, we look at age 66 to 70. And for most people, we end up recommending delaying ben social security benefits so that during that time, you can earn those additional 8% delayed retirement credits. And I'm just gonna put it out there. I mean, for people age 66 to 70, this 8% plus the cost of living adjustment, so let's just call it 10% return a year from social security is nothing that a financial advisor can guarantee you um, in the markets for four years in a row. I'm talking about being guaranteed. So this is truly valuable to delay the benefit and, and receive these credits. And while you're doing that, if you need income to support your living expenses, you may want to consider utilizing 
IRA distributions or other investments to support your living expenses um, to, or even do Roth conversions to fill up those low tax brackets so that by the time you're 70, you can begin receiving your maximum social security benefit. Um, I will say that I think traditional financial planning has always told people to start your benefits as early as possible and delay taking money out of your IRAs for as long as possible. And I'm here to tell you it's actually the opposite in most cases. If you are able to delay your social security benefits and utilize IRA distributions intelligently in a tax efficient way, that can often be much better. Okay, and then just kind of coming up onto the end here, um, what, so the Social Security Administration, believe it or not, there, they, there, there are errors, but they are actually pretty efficient in terms of getting benefits paid on time for the most part and processing all their requests. But that's what they are there for. They are there to help provide you with what your actual benefit is, that, what you're actually entitled to at a certain age. And, and the amount you're entitled to now versus later, they're there to provide you that factual information. But what they can't do is project future benefits through scenario planning. So it's, it's really, you've got two different kind of groups of people. You've got the Social Security Administration there to provide the data. And then you have people like Tom and other financial advisors here to help you analyze the data and make the best recommendation. So all I'm saying is that they're not allowed to give you um, investment and, and strategic planning advice. Um, we did have, I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and address, and address this now. Um, we did have an earlier question just about, um, well, actually, you know what? I will come back to that. Let me, let me come back to that um, before I get to that. So let me just kind of conclude by saying, what if you are here listening today and you've recently started your benefit and you perhaps realize you shouldn't have, there's one do-over opportunity, but it's limited. So if you apply for benefits and you decide you shouldn't have, um, you can return the benefits interest-free to the Social Security Administration within the first 12 months. So you have a year after you apply to stop taking the benefit and returning the money. But one other thing to know is let's say you're 63 years old today and you've started your benefit and you've been collecting it for a year and a half. And so now let's just say you're 65 and maybe you, your life has changed a little bit or you're working and have other income and you realize you really shouldn't have started that benefit at 63. Well, you can't return it to the administration, but you can stop it. And if you stop it, it'll stop right at the amount that you're receiving now and and as you move past your full retirement age, if you don't start taking it yet, it can also earn those delayed retirement credits. And we've actually had multiple clients do this that have come to us and said they made a mistake, they started too early, not full retirement age yet, they've stopped their benefit and are now earning delayed retirement credits on that reduced benefit that they had started early. So that's really important to know that that's an option. Okay, and then here's where I wanted to address this question. Um, oftentimes we do get asked about the government pensions and this, this uh, topic in and of itself is really a whole other presentation because it is such a complicated system. But essentially what these two provisions are, um, the government offset provision and the windfall elimination provision, um, this applies to people that um, are government employees, school teachers, and so forth that have paid into a different system like CalSTRS, for example. If that is the case, there is a very unique specific formula that's used that will offset their social security benefit. Um, and so it's, it's complicated, but the windfall elimination provision applies to individual social security benefits. So if you're a school teacher, and you've paid into a different system and you're getting a CalSTRS pension, then there is a high, chance, high likelihood that you will, your social security benefit will be offset in some way um, or at least reduced. But that all depends on the number of years you've worked at that institution and many other things. I think I'll address that separately when we get to the Q&A. And then the government offset provision 
directly impact, it's the same thing except it impacts your survivor's benefits. So these apply to government um, employees that have paid into a different system. And there's a, I have one specific question on that, which I'll address, address in just a minute. So to end, uh, just to kind of summarize everything here, um, you know, we've talked about so much today, the importance of um, knowing when to apply and crunching the numbers and, you know, coordinating spousal benefits. But I think this is really kind of sums it up here is that it's really just too important to, to make a guess. And you've got to coordinate your strategy of, for Social Security and with all of your other income sources like pensions, earned income, taxes, and so forth. It's got to be one part of your um, complete retirement plan. So that's what I have or what we have for you today. And I think we're now going to do some Q&A. So. All right, thanks to Kristen and Tom. And uh, we have received a few questions. They're gonna sort through them a minute and determine who's gonna answer what and also address the one that we received in advance. But there is one that I can answer and it's how do we get a copy of the presentation? So what I'd like to ask you to do is send me an email. This is my email address and let me know if you prefer it by email or if you want it mailed, I will be happy to print a copy and mail it to you. And so in the email, please provide your mailing address and, uh, or if you just want it emailed then I'll be happy to send it out to you. So that was uh, the answer to one of the questions. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen and Tom and they're gonna go through the, the questions that have come in. Okay, is this uh, okay? Can you hear? Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to address this first question that we received in advance. Um, it's from an individual who was asking how to calculate um, their Social Security benefit because the windfall elimination provision applies to them. And this individual was one that worked as a school teacher for approximately 33 years and is trying to understand what uh, he or what she will be entitled to from Social Security. So this goes back to um, the two different entities where when the first step here is that this individual needs to determine what the actual amount is. And the only way to do that is to collect all of your data, meaning your just identification and work records. And most importantly, um, if you are receiving a pension right now, to provide a pension statement and to call the Social Security Administration. There is a 800 line, you actually do have to call them, provide them with your Social Security information and the information that I just mentioned and request that they calculate what it is that you would actually receive. Um, just for general reference, in this case, this woman um, is saying that uh, she worked for 33 years for the LAUSD. And my understanding is that if you have worked for the government agency more than 30 years, then there will not be an offset. That's my understanding, but anything less than 30 years, there will be an offset to social security. But the only way to truly determine what amount you are entitled to receive is to gather that information and call the administration. And we can provide that phone number to you separately. Okay, here was a question that came in. It said, what is the maximum yearly benefit for Social Security? So the answer to that is it depends. Um, as Kristen mentioned, uh, you go back to the one slide there where it talks about uh, the highest 35 years of earnings. It's gonna be based on those earnings years. And it's a formula that the, uh, um, the Social Security Administration Office uses. And as she mentioned, it's a very complicated uh, formula. Um, so it's going to be really based on what your earnings are. I mean, I've seen, um, you know, maximum benefits of, of you know, $4,000 a month uh, for people that delayed until age 70 that were, you know, an attorney client. So uh, it just really depends. So you can't give you a, a set uh, dollar amount, but uh, again, it's based on what you earned. Okay, this next question says, I am a 55 year old widow. My husband passed away in December, 2020. When do, or what age do I have to apply for spousal social security benefits? 
Um, so the answer is, as a 55-year-old widow, you actually won't apply for a spousal benefit. You'll apply for a survivor's benefit. Um, so the survivor's benefit is 100% of your spouse's, your deceased spouse's benefit. And when you can do that depends on your age. The earliest you can do that is age 60, um, or you can do that at age 50 if you are disabled. Assuming you're just making a, an assumption in this case, if you're not disabled, you need to wait to age 60. But one more thing, importantly with survivor's benefits, you want to um, make sure that you're also using the right strategy here too. In some cases, uh, you may want to take your survivor's benefit and then uh, switch to your own individual benefit or vice versa. So some planning there, but I would say, and just to answer this question, age 60 is when you would apply for your survivor's benefit. Okay, here's a question uh, that came in. It says in April, 2022, can retired people make personal appointments with social security personnel now that uh, America is post COVID? That is a good question. I, I don't have an answer to that. I don't know if you do. Um, that is a great question. And up until now, I have not, or over the last few years, I don't know anyone that has been able to go in person. Um, but regardless, so I, so unfortunately, I don't know if they're actually open to take in-person meetings. But either way, you still have to call and make an appointment. So I would suggest calling the 800 number and asking if you can make an appointment or if you, you may have to make a phone appointment. So, okay. Um, let's see. Shoot, sorry. Sorry, I will repeat. Um, would a, dis a divorced spouse be eligible to receive the deceased spousal social security income? The answer is yes. So with divorced spouses, just like with um, a spousal benefit, um, as long as you are married to the individual for at least 10 years, that's the 10 year rule is for divorced spouses, then you're entitled to either a spousal benefit if you're not remarried, or you're also entitled to a survivor's benefit if your ex-spouse passes away. Um, and there's actually a few other things with that. Um, you're entitled to a survivor's benefit as well if you were married more than once and both of those marriages lasted 10 years and you're not remarried today, you're actually entitled to pick the larger one. So the answer to that question is yes. Okay, here's two questions that are somewhat related, so I will answer both of these. Uh, the first question was, can a married couple each take the individual benefit or does one have to take an individual benefit and the other take a spousal benefit? The answer is, if the individual benefits are higher in both cases, there's no reason to take the spousal benefit. Um, you know, you wanna to try to maximize what you're getting, so get the max, if, if both of yours or $4,000, you shouldn't be taking you know, the spousal um, benefit. And that comes back to this question, what if both spouses get the same benefit? If one spouse dies, will the surviving spouse receive any of the deceased spouse's income? Um, unfortunately, the answer is, is you're gonna get the higher of the two. So if, if the one spouse has a $10 higher benefit than the other one, the social security will, will, will bump it up to that value, but um, you, you're not gonna pick up anything additional. So it'll be one or the other. Okay, this next question is, will having an army pension reduce social security benefits? And the answer is no. Um, my understanding is that um, while it's a government pension, there is not a social security reduction. It's as long as there is social security income that was reported. Let me try to answer this. I think uh, if my ex-spouse takes his social security benefit at age 70, does my age impact my divorced spousal benefit? I don't think it does, does it? No, it does not, yeah. Uh, it, it would not impact you whatsoever. Okay, this one is, if your spouse is a teacher subject to CalSTRS, how is their spousal social security benefit impacted? 
by being someone that receives a CalSTRS pension. <clears throat> it's impacted in the exact same way an individual's benefit would be impacted. So if the spouse is receiving a CalSTRS pension, um, then their spousal benefit for Social Security would also be reduced, just like their individual benefit would be. Okay, here's a good question. What is the relationship between Medicare and Social Security? We were told to sign up for Medicare at age 65, but if you want to defer Social Security to 70, is there any consequence? And the answer there is no. Medicare does require you to apply um, at age 65 even though you, you may turn it on and then uh, you know, defer using it because you might still be working, but you still have to sign up for it. As where with Social Security, you're not required to do that. You can defer until age 70, but um, you know, from, from, a, from a pure income standpoint, it, it makes no sense to wait beyond age 70 to start collecting Social Security. So the, the answer to this question is, is that Medicare and Social Security do, do not impact each other directly. Um, so, yeah. Okay, so this question is very, it's unique in that it requires um, additional analysis to really answer, but I'll go ahead and read the question. Um, I'm married and my husband's full retirement age is April 2023. Mine is also in 2023. I have a small pension available at age 65. Is there a negative to receiving the pension prior to husband retiring? And um, I can't answer that question um, without having additional information. Um, I can't give out that sort of advice, but um, that would require sitting down with an advisor to really look at the entire picture, just to give you the best answer. Okay, here, if a retired professional works part-time from age 67 to age 70, taking out social security, then starts to take out Social Security at age 70 in those three years, how much can that Social Security increase by age 70 when you're forced to start taking Social Security? Well, as we discussed, you're gonna get, you know, from age 67 to 70, you're gonna get that 8% increase um, on, on the benefit plus the COLA adjustment. So roughly about a 10% bump every year. So, you know, if, you're, if you are still working there after age 67, even though you can start collecting it at full retirement age and not get reduced benefits, it may uh, benefit you to, 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 to defer it um, until age 70, as long as you, your income is sufficient to uh, sustain your standard of living. Okay, this question says, I hit the higher level of benefits at 67 and nine months. Is the ninth month, January 2023, at the end of the month, the first day of February, or my birth date on the ninth month, which is January 23rd? Um, so let me start by saying that. Um, so if you are, if you basically you're saying that your full retirement age is 67 and nine months, um, I don't know exactly when they credit, you know, when that kicks in. I, I really, I want to say it's your birth date, but I'd honestly have to check to, to give you the exact date. But I will say this, um, it's not an annual credit. It's a monthly credit that's prorated across the year. So if your full retirement age is 67 and nine months, each month your benefit will go up a little bit with that 8% de that delayed retirement credit that's prorated but I just don't know exactly when they credit it each month. We could look into that for you. Okay, um, if one of the divorced spouses earns more money than the ex-spouse, um, and spouse A works for 15 more years after the, after the divorce until age 70, at which point does spouse A apply for social security? Um, but, the, uh, but spouse B applies for social security under spouses A's earnings at 62. Um, <laughs> okay. I'm going to need a, a little bit of time to kind of read this question. Maybe I could get back to this person. Yeah, I will. It's a pretty, it's detailed and I can certainly answer it. I just need to, don't want to um, keep everyone tied up. So thank you. 
All right, thanks Kristen and Tom for that. And let's give, we'll give them all a round of applause. I know you're doing that from home too. So whoever submitted that last question, if you would send me an email directly um, indicating that was your question, then we'll know how to get back to you, okay? So that we can, uh, you know, it, it sounds like it takes a little bit of time to review all of that. So um, just send me an email and we'll, we'll make sure we can get back to you. So I hope you all enjoyed today's webinar. I think, you know, there's just so much great information here and uh, we're happy to be able to share it with you. I think we did get to all of the questions, but if we didn't, um, then please email me at the, uh, my email address or give me a call at the, the number on the screen here and we'll uh, make sure that you get, uh, you get, we'll try and get you an answer. So the, like I said earlier, the recording will be posted on our website and for everybody who registered in advance and I have an email address for, I'll send you that when I'll, to let you know when it's posted and what the location of that is. Um, next, next time we were meeting on May 13. Uh, at this time, we're still planning to do it via Zoom and the topic will be estate planning basics in 2022. We'll have an attorney, Eric Harris here and certified financial planner, Nadia Antti, who will be um, talking to you about uh, the, that, the process of creating your estate plan and updating it as necessary. Such an important thing to give attention to. Then in July, we're gonna um, have a related uh, seminar. The topic will be about all the emotional aspect of estate planning and investing and how that impacts sometimes the decisions we make. So uh, be sure to keep that in mind on July 8th. And like I said, we're kind of watching, monitoring the, the whole COVID situation. And, and at some point, maybe this year, or hopefully certainly by next year, we'll be able to return to our Saturday morning in-person seminar. So thank you all for tuning in. Uh, direct any questions to me on the, with the contact information on the screen and uh, enjoy the rest of your day and have a good weekend.